Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us, the Master of Science in Threat and Response Management program here tonight. We're really excited to have you all here and to, um, you know, talk about this really important um, topic right now. Um, before we get started, um, the lecture itself will go for about 45 minutes to an hour, and then there'll be time for questions. We'd really appreciate it if you could keep your questions to the end. Um, yeah, okay, and... I was also told to remind you. Um, any of you who are applying or interested in applying for the program, I, we are hosting an online application workshop tomorrow to help you make an outstanding application. So um, if you haven't already registered, I definitely encourage you to do so. So without further ado, welcome to tonight's event, The Storm After the Storm, The Long Run Effects of Natural Disaster. My name is Natalie Foster, and I am the program manager for the program. And it gives me great pr pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Amir Gina. Amir is an assistant professor at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy, where he researches how economic and social development is shaped by the environment. He uses applied economic techniques, climate science, and remote sensing to understand the impacts of climate change and natural disasters in rich and poor countries, and has conducted fieldwork in India, Bangladesh, Kenya, and Uganda. Before joining the University of, the Chi of Chicago, Amir received his PhD in Sustainable Development from Columbia University and has worked with the Red Cross in South Asia. Please welcome me in joining Amir. Thank you very much. I, hopefully this is on and you can hear me. So just to give a broad sense of background about who I am, why I'm here, what my research is, and what I'm going to talk to you about. So I came into, I'm basically an economist. I came into it through a, weird, through a weird path. I started off in maths and theoretical physics, and then I started to realize that that was probably far too abstract for the things that I was interested in. And I thought that climate science was this nice way to take the physics that I had learned and apply it to something which mattered to people. But while I started learning about that, just before I started my PhD, I realized that some of the biggest questions were not necessarily about what happens to air as it heats up and as the as CO2 increases and traps traps heat in the in the atmosphere, but rather what what we as a as a society or we as a species even do to respond to this. How is it that we are shaped by the environment around us? Why do we do some things well in terms of our environmental policies? Why do we do some things badly? And those questions were the ones which fascinated me a lot more. I had the fortune right at the start of graduate school to be working with the Red Cross in, and Red Crescent in India and Bangladesh, um, which is one where I took this picture, but two where I started really thinking about disasters and the way which they could affect society in, in ways which we weren't really measuring correctly. Um, so some of the things that I'm, I'm going to say, it sounds a little bit like environmental determinism, that the environment is determining the abilities of societies to grow and develop. It's not really that. I'd say call it neo-environmental determinism if you want. What, what we set out to do in a lot of this research is not say that the environment is the most important thing for determining economic prospects, but that it is an important thing, one among many. And in order to make the right policies, in order to make rational policies to deal with disasters, with climate change, with air pollution, we need to understand exactly what the extent of those impacts are. So a lot of it, to put it in a very unglamorous way, a lot of what I do is really about measurement, solving measurement issues with the environment. Um, in that way, I like to think of myself as a scientist as well as an economist. Um, I guess economists are scientists. But the the result of all of this measurement is to find some kind of unique things, um, answers to empirical questions about, um, particularly about natural disasters, which I'm going to discuss today, um, and the way in which they affect society in the long run. So as a broad overview of the talk, I'm going to talk, as you, as you expect, about the long run impacts of disasters. This is not really where a lot of people get into this. There, there's an a large and incredibly important industry set of researchers, everything about how to deal with disasters immediately after the fact. So immediate response to those, to those impacts. There's less understanding of, of how those policies play out in the long run, but also how to deal with the issues in the long run, or even if there are impacts in the long run. 
So that's kind of where what I'm going to give an overview of. Um, I'm going to try and keep it at a, at a pretty high level and give you a flavor of what the research is, not go into a huge amount of statistical or mathematical detail unless you want me to, in which case raise your hand and I'm happy to, to talk about statistics for a while. But, the, but I want to give you a sense of, of really try to, to get at these, this set of questions here. In the end, we'll talk a little bit about Puerto Rico and some work that I've been, I've been involved in there. Um, or I've definitely been watching. So the first one is, is what are the effect that disasters have on long-run economic development, if any? So this was the big question which kind of started off my research career, um, probably seven or eight years ago now, um, with this particular paper. If there are effects, would we see them in the United States? The United States is the richest economy in the world, extremely adapted, good infrastructure. Um, would we see them in the United States? Similar question, would we see them in Japan, other places that are wealthy and well, are what we would think would be well adapted? If we do see them, what are the mechanisms? Why would we see a, a long run effect? When we know that in a lot of places we have really coherent um, disaster management policies, um, particularly for dealing with short run impacts. And then something which I probably know much less about than than people sitting in this room. What do we learn for policy? And how can we de decrease negative impacts if we see them? So that's broadly what I'm going to try and talk about and give you a flavor of what the research is saying about this. Um, so when I started thinking about this question with my, my co-author, Saul Shang, who's a professor at UC Berkeley, as I said, about eight years ago or so, we actually started thinking about it based on a, an interesting picture we saw of data from Haiti. So in the 60s and 70s, Haiti was growing. Its economy was booming. It was growing very quickly. And in 1980, for some reason, this growth trajectory changed. And it started a decline, which it hasn't really come out of. Um, and then after that, in, in 86, 87, there was coups. There was political unrest through the 90s. There was a massive earthquake in 2000 and, 2010. So this was a started off thinking a little bit about Haiti and, and what happened exactly at that point in 1980. It turns out at that point, there was a hurricane called Hurricane Allen, which at the time was the most intense landfalling hurricane that had hit any, anywhere in the Atlantic, right in 1980 when all these things happened. As we got deeper into the research, first of all, the data from Haiti are, for reasons that you can probably understand, very difficult. It's not, it's not the best data in the world. Um, but also a lot of other things happened at the time. So we took a step back and started thinking, well, what would this, what, what do people think would happen when a disaster hits a country to their economy? Would we see something like that, that effect that we saw in Haiti where we're growing through the 60s and 70s and then suddenly in 1980 we stop? Um, and basically economists, the way they had thought about this, had come up with four different hypotheses, all of these based on theoretical concerns. They didn't really have a satisfying empirical answer. So, what we have is we have uh, GDP per capita, so we think of it income, income per capita, growing at some baseline level. And so a country is growing in some way, and a disaster strikes. The way economists were thinking about this, there was four things that could happen, and each people kind of stuck to their guns on, on different ones. But by and large, a lot of economists thought that one of these two top trajectories was, would be what would be observed. So we'd have something called creative destruction. So a disaster comes in, you have a lot of out-of-date infrastructure, out-of-date capital, it gets de destroyed and demolished, it gets rebuilt, and then suddenly we have this very beneficial effect on the economy. The economy starts to boom because we end up with, instead of a bad factory, we have a good factory. You produce more. The reason, the difference between these two is that in the top one, you would also see that the the disaster would have larger effects on, on the equilibrium in the economy, and that you would end up having increase in wages. So labor, would, labor supply would go down in some area, and people would migrate in, and so it would start to boom straight away. And that's really what was stuck in the mind of a lot of economists, that disasters should be good for development. In fact, after Harvey, the, the chairman of the New York Fed, made this claim on, on NBC, that he said, I apologize for saying it, it sounds insensitive, but we know disasters are good for growth, so we'll get over this initial um, misery that people are seeing, and things will be fine. Again, this is an idea that's really entrenched in a lot of economists' minds. 
this idea of building back better that maybe you'd have some some declines in the in the immediate term but that you'd as the the good factories you've built kick in you'd start to see this boon to your economy one which has been observed and effect has been observed in some other empirical situations so two that come to mind are, are population recovery after bombings in Japan it looked like that population recovered after these big shocks during World War II and one of the reasons to think of that is maybe that you know World War II ends we don't expect it to happen again and so people will start to move start to have children and that population will recover because there's some economic benefit to being in a certain part of the world there's trade routes in Tokyo and etc so people would move back in and, and populations would start to grow and eventually we'd get back to where we were growing before and then there's this more pessimistic one um, and I hate I hate to tell you that I'm on this pessimistic track both ex ante this is what I what I thought would be the case this was the prior that prior information that was in my mind but it's also the one that we find empirically and this would just say that some of these shocks are so large um, that it will push us off the trajectory we will our economy will diverge from the what we call the counterfactual what would have happened if the disaster had never hit and we'll end up on a new trajectory that's lower than the old one so these were the four things that were in people's minds and as I said a lot of economists were, were thinking that these two would be naturally what the solution would be a lot of that's coming from reasoning from old um, economic growth models that everyone learns when they're doing their first macroeconomics class um, but it's a very strong it's a very strong belief among people so there was these competing hypotheses there was no real answer to those just by thinking through theory we can come up with anything any part discussion of what's happening in the economy to think of some friction maybe people will be able to move in and so we'll see this boon maybe they won't there'll be some barrier to migration you can put in different frictions to what's happening in the economy to kind of end up at any one of these so what we wanted to know is what was actually happening how would we solve this issue how would we understand this it was it was an empirical question which needed to be resolved a lot of the previous research had issues with measurement the way we measure disasters is not um, which might be surprising to hear it's considering they're so economically important um, it's not particularly good the way researchers have been doing this was if a disaster happens in a year they say okay disaster happened it gets a one in your data if a disaster didn't happen it gets a zero but that just means that everything every hurricane small and large is treated exactly the same every earthquake is treated the same as a hurricane is treated the same as a flood all disasters were treated in the same kind of way in a lot of these in a lot of this uh, research so we had to try and resolve that somehow so basically what we did using this training in both climate science and economics we decided we'd use the climate science to try and tell us what the what the disaster was actually doing if we could measure its intensity we'd be able to solve this measurement problem so the first thing that we had to do was build this global model of hurricanes hurricanes tropical cyclones typhoons I'll use them all or storms I'll use them all interchangeably this was a typhoon typhoon Nanmadol I think um, over the Philippines which is seen here this tiny bar scale is here is a hundred kilometers these are huge events they happen over a very short period of time in a few days they can cause a lot of economic damage and we know that there's certain measurement of damage so measured with a lot of error sometimes it's just we know what the insurance claims are we don't know what the, the uninsured losses are but we want to get at something which um, we wanted to get at something which says more about what's the the evolution of the economy after one of these things hits so we built this model knowing what the meteorology was like for a storm swirling around knowing that they're measured kind of well from satellites and we know where the track is we know what the pressure is we built this model which showed here's what the average exposure is for all of these countries for all of these regions around the world so you can see that this is the Atlantic basin here and these are the Atlantic storms averaged over about 50 60 years the redder colors are the more intense in terms of wind speeds so you can see that the average wind speeds around this Pacific basin are much more intense so the typhoons are more intense partly that's because the the Pacific Ocean is bigger it has more time to gather energy and, and um, become stronger storms places like the Philippines are getting hit by 10 15 20 storms per year so it's a very active cyclone climate so we build this model but the important thing in the research was to to not just look at what the average effect is 
um, but instead to look at each specific year. So an important thing to realize was that storms are going to happen around the world. These tropical cyclones are going to happen, but the exact path they take is completely random. Whether something hits, hits uh, the Philippines or Taiwan or parts of mainland, Ch mainland China or, or Japan, it's kind of random. You don't know at the start of a season if something's going to hit. So we exploit this and we look at essentially what happens within a year in its economic, within a country within its economic growth. And in the years when it gets hit by a storm, we're using that kind of as the, the, the treatment in our experiment. So we're saying that we have the year in which it's treated, it gets a storm, and the year in which it doesn't, it's the control group. And we look at that variation that happens with the storms as they're getting hit. We don't just do this for one year. We do this for 60 years, as I said. So this is the reconstruction historically of every tropical cyclone which is which has hit the Earth. And we know exactly what the wind speed is, what the power is at each point on the surface. Um, so we're, now we have our, our setup. And so what do we find? The, here's the hypotheses that we had before. Um, I've already kind of given the game away. You know what we found? We found this. So going, looking at these two things together, we have the same kind of picture. We have our baseline trend growing. We have, from two different data sets, way that you measure, of two different data sets that are measuring the, the um, in, income per capita for people, we see that when a storm hits, and I'm saying storms now rather than disasters, there is some evidence that the same thing holds for earthquakes, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done on those as well. You start to see that, compared to what the growth trajectory was, you see this divergence. So it starts to grow slower. And you get this widening separation between the place that gets hit by the storm and what would have happened if it hadn't been hit by the storm. It's pretty substantial by the time you get to the end. This is, this is modeled out for a, a uh, uh, one standard deviation storm. It's not really important, but a storm of a certain size. But for every meters per second increase in wind speed, we see about a 0.3% decrease in the level of GDP 15 years later. So that's meter per second averaged over a whole country. We can go a lot more into that. It's kind of a weird measure to think of, but I'll put up some magnitudes later so you can kind of think about this. But you start to see this divergence. Now, there's a couple of things that, that are, I think, important to note here for thinking about disaster management, any kind of uh, shock that you'll face to businesses, to anything, um, at the time of a, of a large environmental shock, is that around the time that it happens, we don't really see very much. Almost all of what we think about for disasters is focused on this period here. The year of, the year after, um, maybe a couple of years after, but then it quickly fades from memory. But we don't see very much. Part of the reason there is because these four hypotheses are, are kind of true in the short term. If you get a big disaster that gets a lot of attention, you can get a lot of inflow of aid, inflow of, of workers, labor moves around. So you can get this boost in the year. You get a lot of reconstruction, which helps GDP. You count the things you build back. You don't count the things that were lost. So it looks like your GDP increases in the year after. So you can get this boost. Sometimes you can get the opposite. If the disaster isn't big enough to really gain a lot of international attention, if you're in a, if you're in a poorer country, um, or if it's not even particularly large in the US, you don't get as much FEMA, atten FEMA money coming from it. Um, you can see that there would be losses in that year. And it's very idiosyncratic which disasters get the attention and which don't um, within a certain threshold. The very large ones will get a lot of attention. There's a medium range where sometimes people will pay attention, sometimes they won't. And you'll see this kind of noisy response there. Who knows what's happening? Sometimes there'll be a boost, sometimes there won't be. So that's one of the reasons it's difficult to see anything here, because it kind of bounces around. It's unclear. But what this is showing that, what is that this is showing then is that regardless of what's happening here, for every single storm that's ever hit, made landfall in any country, since 1950 to 2008, their economies for those countries started to slow down. 
and they started to gradually diverge from where they were before the storm hit. This is something that's very difficult to see in the data. If you're just looking at the GDP of some country and you see it kind of, it would be difficult to pick out where it starts to slow down because there's no one giant shock where you can pick it out. So that story of Haiti, of seeing Haiti growing and then, and then the growth trajectory changing, you don't really see that in a lot of countries. You just see this very gradual change in their GDP, which is what we see here. It's kind of remarkable. We were very skeptical of this result because when you look at the magnitudes of some of the storms, these effects are actually quite big. So 0.3% seems small. Um, I'll get onto what that means for Puerto Rico and Hurricane Maria at the end. Um, but some of these effects are quite large. The other thing to think about is what happens for repeated hurricanes. So places that get hit by a hurricane are often getting hit again and again and again. It's not like we'll have one hurricane in the US and then we wait 20 years um, and we have no hurricanes. So here we have this thing for a single storm. We see the years after the storm up to 20 that we look like there's no recovery. Um, even as we go out to 30, it looks like there's no recovery. Back to this, this baseline. But then what happens if you're getting hit each year? Like the Philippines that I said is getting hit every single year by many storms. So we have our baseline trend. A storm hits in year zero. And we have this divergence, which is the thing that, we had, that I just showed on the previous slide. So this is what is happening if a country is growing at around 2%, gets hit by a storm, it grows a little bit slower. What if it gets hit, it gets hit again after three years? At that point, three years, ago, three years in, we see that it starts to diverge again. If it gets hit after seven or eight years, eight years, I guess, it starts to diverge. 15 starts to diverge again. So we see this very slow, almost imperceptible drag on the economy that we see here because we solved this measurement problem that wasn't really clear before. Um, if you think about this, it's pretty hard to do the mental math on this. But if you think about this, um, think about the countries that, are, that have a very active cyclone climate, like the Philippines, places in Southeast Asia, the US, Caribbean islands. They're getting hit each year. This is acting to slow down their growth in a pretty significant way. We calculate in this research what this sums up to across the whole world, and it's a couple of percent lower global growth because of these. It does look like some countries are adapting. So places that get hit all the time have smaller losses for each storm that hits them. They're also getting hit by more storms. So you've got to multiply all those things out. But it looks like it's a pretty robust thing that's happening that you see this slowdown of GDP. OK, to put this effect in some context, we went through the economics literature and looked at kind of the levels of, of or the effects that have been estimated for big shocks to an economy and tried to think about where the sizes that we had, because it was a little bit difficult to think about them, where the sizes that we had fit in with that. So we see that, for example, the estimate of a civil war after 10 years, it slowed down your, um, it's lowered your GDP by 3%. The kind of one of the standard sizes of, of cyclones has lowered it by 3.6% after 20 years, which is what we find. So larger effects than, than civil wars on average. It's something which sits in quite well with financial crises, currency crises. These are large shocks to the economy and have long, long lasting effects. OK. But then, of course, as the US, wealthiest country in the world, should we be seeing this? There's, a, there's an interesting fact which has been noted in a lot of this rich literature, that disasters, when they hit in rich countries, cause more property damages than they do loss of life. Or relatively, they, they cause more. Because um, there's more expensive capital, there's more exposed property to get damaged. But people are kind of shielded from what, the, what the, the intensity of the event is. In poorer countries, the opposite is true. You have a situation where you can have much higher loss of life, but much lower monetary damages. And this shifts as countries get richer. As people start to get more protection, um, you see this shift away from mortality and more towards property damages. So richer countries, US, Japan, who are two countries that are, are both wealthy and exposed to a lot of natural disasters. Um, you have better infrastructure, they're getting warning systems, it gets 
modeling these kinds of disasters, modeling the, the hurricanes to give us uh, you know, a three to five day warning has become a pretty exact science. There's still a big, as you probably have seen those, those diagrams, the cones of uncertainty that the National Hurricane Center gives. There's a, a wide range where they can go, but we're getting pretty good at being able to pick up where the storms are gonna be and give people warning to evacuate people. It's another reason why there's lower loss of life in, in, um, in wealthier countries, lower loss of life in the US. So let me ask the question, is the US adapted to hurricane disasters? Do we still see this effect in the US or should we? So we broke up the world into different countries. So small island developing states, you kind of think they would be the most vulnerable because they're tiny, stronger wind speeds. When a hurricane hits them, it's sometimes the size of the island. So their whole economy is, is affected. It looks like to within a range of uncertainty, but the response is really similar between those and all the other countries. If we break this up by the major different basins, North America, all of the countries affected by that North American basin hurricane, that's right on where the, the effect that I showed you before is. Um, looks like Asia is probably having a little bit of a larger effect, maybe because they have stronger storms. But this is something which happens across the size of countries, but also across the, the, um, the regions. So this is, again, the percent of GDP that is lowered years after a storm. And that's what the growth trajectory looks like. Then the thing which was kind of most fascinating, and I hope you can see it here, because I can't really see it on this screen. Um, if we divided the world up into rich countries and, and poor countries, based on above, above median income, below median income, the effect looks almost identical. For each meter per second of storm, you're getting, again, after 15 years, about a 0.3% decrease in GDP, regardless of what your income is. So that's kind of puzzling. You can imagine that this would happen in developing countries. Why is something like this happening in the US? What is the mechanism for this happening in the US? We've got, uh, we've got FEMA, we've got aid money, we've got reconstruction money that happens straight away. Um, so why was this something which would happen there? Just a little bit more on, on the US, particularly speaking about hurricanes. So the effects are the same in the US as they are in other parts of the world. In terms of damages, and this is kind of surprising, there's a, a paper from a couple of years ago by Laura Backinson and Rob Mendelson showing that the amount of damage that the US experiences, conditional on the size of the storm, hasn't really changed in the past 30 or 40 years. The rest of the world is showing that it's adapting. The amount of damage it has for a certain intensity of storm is decreasing through time, slowly in some cases, but definitely decreasing. But the US has stayed kind of the same. And that's this big puzzle. A lot, sometimes the culprit is pointed at, the, the culprit of this that is pointed to is a national flood insurance program. This has built in a lot of intense financial risk um, when places are exposed to, to hurricanes. We have a lot of capital, we have a lot of households, we have a lot of people who are vulnerable staying in places that are very vulnerable because they're not paying the right insurance levels to stay there. And that's a, definitely a bigger problem than just this simple description I gave. You have people who are essentially stuck in houses with zero value that they can't sell because they're so frequently exposed and all they can do is get federal money to rebuild them year in, year out. So that's one of the reasons why we think that the US probably hasn't shown the same level of adaptation as others. It's an incredibly hard problem to, to deal with, and I'm sure there's people in this room that know more about it than I do. Um, but it's leading to this massive drag, we think, on the US economy. OK, so what about mechanisms? What could lead to this big decline in GDP? There's probably a lot of them. It's important to think about what happens when disasters hit. So we think about what happens straight away. You can have loss of life. You have damage to your infrastructure, um, damage to factories, things that are producing. So you can think of that. But you also have these other effects that are a little bit longer and a little bit more insidious, maybe. So you can see businesses closing. 
I'm going to use a really economics -y term and say you have misallocation of labor. I'll, expl I'll explain that in a second. You can have export shocks. So either families, families, either factories are damaged and they don't produce as much, or ports are damaged and they can't export as much. Um, you see migration, and there's some research on that that I'll show about um, Hurricane Katrina. And there's potentially a lot of other ones. So just going through a little bit of those, this is now research which has been done um, in the last few years, by and large, looking at what some of these the causes of this big effect could be. So in a really interesting piece of research that was done about business closures after Hurricane Katrina, there's various, there's various ideas of what's actually happening after, to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. And some people say that some areas have kind of grown back better than they ever were before. Some places like the Lower Ninth, which was most affected, is still um, kind of a bit of a quagmire, um, economically speaking. So some places have grown, some places haven't. What this paper does is it looks at businesses and it looks across places that have different levels of damage due to Hurricane Katrina. And so you see that in the, the year when the storm hit, we have that set as zero. That's the number of businesses there were. Um, ignore kind of what this is. This is just effectively think of it as a number of businesses. And you see that through time, the places that are undamaged, so in Louisiana, there seems to be this kind of this already de slow decrease of the, uh, of the number of businesses in the economy. The places that experienced a lot of damage from Hurricane Katrina had this this jump to go lower. So businesses were closing. It was often small businesses. You can see this looking just within these damaged counties here, the ones that were growing lower, that were closing more frequently. The places with really severe damage, the businesses closed much quicker. Often these were small businesses, and then there was more consolidation. So things like Walmart were kind of fine because they had this diversified uh, supply chain. A small business didn't really have that. So you see a lot of small businesses closing. And then you can think of, well, what does that do to a local economy or even a national economy? You have a lot of people who are losing jobs, et cetera. So this could be one underlying mechanism. Here's this labor misallocation thing. So this is a paper by, um, by Tatiana Gerigina at UIUC. So you look at what happens to US, all US counties after a, a storm hits. Um, and you see this surprising fact that the transfers from the government start to increase. This is the year that the storm hits. This is years after the storm. These are years before. And effectively, what this means is that more people are going on unemployment insurance. You see the number of people unemployed, number of adults employed is decreasing. And this is lasting for 10 years. The most amazing thing about this paper, the, the, sum, the headline of it, is that the cost of this of social security and of unemployment insurance is 10 times the damages that occurred from the hurricane in the year that it happened. So then we experience these damages and then we experience effectively 10 times more damages that are stuck with us for the next 10 years. So this is called, I'm calling this misallocation of labor. You have all these people who were previously employed, who could have been contributing to the economy in some way, who for some reason at the time that the storm hit, lost jobs and are never able to get them back. Either their businesses have closed or some other reason. So this is another reason, thinking about why this effect might be this long-term thing. I'll get to what some of the implications are for this for policy in a moment. We have migration. This is by the same, one of the same authors. Um, and apologies for this, for this image. But the thing I want you to see here are two different things. So this is what happens to people after Hurricane Katrina. So a lot of people migrated. And this paper got their tax returns and looked at what happened to their wages, the people who migrated versus the people who stayed, and followed them for a few years. So you see this just in thinking about their wages. You see that they initially lost wages when they migrated. They're obviously searching for new jobs, something like that. But after a year or two, their wages start to increase. So you could think, oh, these people who migrated after Hurricane Katrina are better off. That would lead to some kind of potential decline around Louisiana but maybe benefits elsewhere. But then you see this other thing that makes this a more complicated picture. Those people are also permanently 
drawing down their retirement savings. So whether or not you think this is a good thing that you make more wages today, but have less income in the future when your retirement savings is kind of an open question. And I think these two are really trading off each other. So it's unclear whether migration is actually beneficial or harmful, um, but it's definitely something which happens after disasters. This is on a paper about the Philippines. You see the parents stop investing in their kids. So in a developing country, you can imagine that this would be a big issue. People are then developing less skills. Human capital kind of slows down a little bit. But effectively, households, the, the axis is flipped here. So this is losses in this direction. After a storm hits, sorry, after a storm hits, people are losing are spending less money. They're reducing their expenditures. And then you see a lot of um, potentially bad things happen in that time. You can extrapolate a little bit from this to the US. So if I, in the year after a storm, have to spend less money, I might be in a situation, if I'm in a low-income family, of having to make a trade-off between a set of important things, medication, doctor visits, education, etc. Those immediate shocks are things which carry on with us for years afterwards. This is a paper I just saw recently. This is looking at trades at, trade at a port level. So a storm hits and then months after, you see that exports are declining. So either it's, it's factories which are damaged, production is damaged, or it's something like um, ships being diverted and then never going back to that port because they view this as an extra risk. And so you see all the, the imports and exports, exports in particular, but imports also, um, being affected in the long run because a storm hits once. So this five-day event, which then starts, stop, starts a port declining over this two-year period and not seeming to recover. So it's important here, what the research is, is showing from the last few years is that um, it's important to think about what is actually happening when a disaster hits. So not just thinking about the immediate things that we can see and observe. Not just seeing, in the case of Hurricane Sandy, which happened while I was living in New York, um, there was houses in Staten Island, expensive houses with insurance, which were the poster children for the damage from Hurricane Sandy. And people lost their lives and it was a serious thing. And they are the images that we think of for a disaster. But what's also happening is that there are People who didn't lose as much, but because of power losses in Manhattan, low-income families, particularly Hispanic families in New York, couldn't go to work that week, sometimes lost their job. But that weak shock to income is something which can often lead to extra payday loans, which is interest you're accruing sometimes over the long run, to people not buying medication, to other things which we don't really think of as disaster impacts. We don't think of unemployment in the long run as a disaster impact, but that could be one of the things which is leading to this large diversion between what would have happened um, had we not experienced the disaster and what happened when we, when we experienced it. So there's something about the saliency of the indicators we use. We really focus on that moment, those moments afterwards, not potentially on the things which are a little bit more insidious, which we don't notice, which could drag on over time. Okay, what does this mean for disaster policy? As I said, this is the part that I probably don't have as much to say on. I get to research miserable things every day, but not as many positive things. Broadly speaking, there's kind of two, there's two distinct periods of concern when you think about any kind of disaster or big shock. There's immediately after the first few months, that kind of stuff. And then there's the rest of the time. A lot of the policy focuses on this immediate aftermath. So even rebuilding policy is about rebuilding things that were lost not necessarily changing plans or zoning, particularly in the US, to deal with six months after to the next 50 years in some cases when you're building power plants, roads, lots of large infrastructure projects. The results that I showed on what's happening at the macroeconomic scale, what's happening to the country's income, are inclusive of every policy that everyone has ever put in place to deal with disasters. Despite that, we still see this decline. So the reason that things might be noisy right in the year after or the year around a disaster happens is because some of those policies work, some of them don't work, but they might be doing a good job of smoothing over those initial few years. 
But it's clear that because we see this drag on the economy, that there's something that we're not doing thinking about long-term policies, either in the actions we take immediately after disaster, which could benefit, reduce damages, reduce economic loss in the long term, or the policies that we have over the long term. Um, so it seems like perhaps even if we do one right immediately afterwards, we're definitely not thinking of this six months to years afterwards. Um, there's a really interesting piece of research which came out last year looking at the effect of FEMA spending. And it finds that the stuff that we, sp we spend ex ante, so risk reduction money, and this is, I think, one of the first, there's, there's this whole global movement on disaster risk reduction, which takes, which posits that, and takes, in some cases, for granted that spending money on disasters before they happen reduces damages in the long run, that it's a better thing to do. It's something which doesn't have a lot of research support. It's very difficult to try and find out the effect of a disaster that didn't happen because you invested in something. Um, so there's this great paper looking at what happens um, with FEMA spending that happens before a disaster, so risk reduction, versus ex post, stuff that happens afterwards, recovery, reconstruction, that kind of stuff, and finds that it's twice as effective at reducing damages. Which is pretty cool. Except even this is open to interpretation because the specific projects and the amount that's spent on risk reduction is much smaller than the stuff that's spent afterwards. So maybe it's only that people, what we have in these data are only the absolute best projects that people wanted to spend their money on, not cleaning up after every disaster. Um, but it's definitely a um, really suggestive and really encouraging piece of research that a lot of this could be about planning and about risk reduction rather than dealing with the effects after they happen. OK, I'll move on for the last few minutes to talking about Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rico, is most, as I'm, I'm sure everyone in the room has, has, has heard, is going through this massive debt crisis. It's the largest debt crisis in US history. Um, Puerto Rico has a very unique relationship with, with uh, the mainland US, uh, not a state not independent, somewhere in between, and has a lot of potentially distortionary policies because of that. So in particular, trade has to go through US ports. It's very difficult for it to set trade policy or wages or anything independently. So it's this very unique case. And what happened last September, is, as we all know, was um, Hurricane Maria. So one of the most active, one of the most damaging, I think the most damaging hurricane season um, in the US, with these three big storms, Harvey, Irma, Irma and Maria. And Maria hit Puerto Rico, went completely over the island, such that effectively there was not a single person on the island, the whole population, that didn't experience at least a Category 3 wind speed. And that's huge for such a large area. That's one of the largest landfalling storms in terms of energy experienced by everybody on the island that's ever been experienced. Um, because of the debt crisis, there was an appointed group um, under an act called PROMESA that was meant to step in, impose austerity on the economy, try to deal with the debt crisis. The Senate appointed. Um, they spent a couple of years coming up with a financial plan, thinking about how they would pay back the debtors, how they would invest in the Puerto Rican economy, what the tax base would be. Very exciting things, thinking, trying to project what the tax base would be. It turns out that that's a one of the single most important things um, that you could be thinking about when you're thinking about what's happening with Puerto Rico. If the economic growth slows down, the tax base is going to be much lower. They can pay back less money. If it gets to the extent where the debt that they have to pay back is so large, um, is, is extremely large, it could push them into an economic down spiral, which they might not recover from from a generation. It's an extremely important thing to think about. The, they came up with this fiscal plan and said, OK, here's what the Puerto Rican economy is going to be like. Here's what population movements are going to be like for the next few years. And they decided on that in summer of last year after much negotiation. And then Hurricane Maria happened, and they effectively tore it up. So then the question for them was, what do we think 
the economy is going to do in Puerto Rico after we've had this. So not in next year, not in the year after, but in the long term over the course of these, um, over the course of, of these loan payback periods. So there was obviously much concern. There was, as I've kind of pointed out, not too much research on that beyond the, the paper that I was talking about at the start. And so through, through some people at the IMF who knew about this paper and had replicated and shown that the results were real, um, and through a, an op-ed that, that the group that I work with published in the New York Times, they saw, OK, here's we're, we have a problem here. The economic projections, the economic assumptions that we previously had are going to be way off if this, if this is actually borne out. So here's what Hurricane Maria looked like in terms of the miles per hour of wind speed. Um, as I said, if you look at something here, there was nobody on the island who didn't experience at least a Category 3. It went completely over the island. Um, this is what we project would happen. So this dark gray line is what was happening with Puerto Rican income per capita um, before the storm. The storm hits here. This is just extrapolating out the growth, average growth rate of the last few years. So this is kind of the what would have happened if the storm didn't hit, assuming that Puerto Rico was, was acting in the same way as it was here. Here's what our results would suggest would happen with the, with the economy after 15 years, 20 years. So what they were interested in is this gap here. We estimated that as the effect of Hurricane Maria in 15 years from now, leaving the economy 21% lower than it would have been otherwise. This is an enormous event leading to enormous uh, damage to the economy. Putting that in context, like we did before with some other things, you know, this is on par with the Asian financial crisis um, impacts on Indonesia. It's up there with some of the worst Great Recession effects that we saw in the United States. This is something which has major implications for, for the Puerto Rican economy. And so they put forward a plan which would take this into account. The question that I, that I asked at the start, what happens immediately after a, a disaster, is something that they have a big issue with. A lot of aid and FEMA money came in, and that's going to look like there's some kind of boon to the economy in that year. And so if you're sitting as one of the debt owners, you think, OK, their economy is growing in that year. Disasters are good for development because they have this uh, view in their mind of the economists that this means we're going to build back better and everything's fine. You could be sitting from the point of view of the government thinking, OK, this is good, but it's not enough money to rebuild. We've got this ailing infrastructure, but let's get as much as we can. People are thinking a lot about what happens in that year. An important thing about um, Puerto Rico's political status is that a lot of the aid money actually just came right back to the mainland US. It was a lot of jobs. It was you know, ComEd going there and rebuilding some power infrastructure. But they were teams coming down from the mainland US. And so then you've got to try and understand what, how much of that FEMA money that went in, out of the billions that went there, actually stays in Puerto Rico and helps people. The answer is probably pretty low, something like something between 10 and 20%. So of all of that aid money, only about 10 or 20% of it went to Puerto Rico or stayed within Puerto Rico. It also has this other challenge of massive population movements. The population now is about between 3 and 4 million. Um, people are leaving at a massive rate. and we still don't have good numbers on what's going to happen, but it looks like the island of Puerto Rico is going to have this large population decline. So it's got everything stacked against them. And then thinking about this, this hurricane effect um, makes it kind of a, 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 a thornier issue. So what they have proposed is that based on the money that they're getting in, they will have this bump in year one. As that money stops, they will have this big decline. And then they're going to have this low-ish growth rate, where there is some kind of growth, but their economy is diverging. So if you kind of ignore what happens here, because as I said, this is the part where it's noise and it goes anywhere, they're aiming 
to say, give a range of scenarios, but one of the most likely scenarios is somewhere here, 21% lower. And what does that mean for their debt payback? That's something which is, I think, they just released their plan about a month ago. So we were working with them on trying to understand just how unprecedented this effect is, whether it's true for small islands, whether it's whether um, you know, places like Grenada that had experienced big hurricanes had recovered differently, or just how unique and unusual this is. Um, all the evidence that we can find using the techniques that I, I showed at the start points to this being uh, a real thing that will be experienced without some major structural change. As I said, the plan was just released in the past couple of weeks. All of those people who own their debt are going to be facing what you'd call a haircut. They're not going to get back all the money that they're owed. If they try to get back all the money that they're owed, it could push Puerto Rico into this economic spiral that I won't be recovered from. It could slow down the recovery. And so there will be, over the coming months, a pretty, uh, I'd say, energetic debate uh, in courts, in Congress, in the Senate about exactly what the implications of this are. Um, but by and large, they're looking at this 21% number as what the economy is going to be like in 15 years. OK, so some conclusions then. So disasters are negatively affecting economies in the long run. This research was for hurricanes, and I'm mostly focused on hurricanes. But there's some evidence now that it's also true for earthquakes, maybe over slightly shorter time horizons. But a lot of these long-run effects are showing up in different things, not just the economy, also in trade, et cetera. It's remarkably generalizable across countries. This is something, this is a policy gap that we're not understanding for some reason. That as good as we get at dealing with disasters immediately afterwards, there's something which means that we don't deal with the long run in, the, in a way which is, uh, which is allowing those economies to grow as, as fast as they were. Um, the mechanism, there's probably not one reason why this is happening. As I showed, there's lots of different reasons why this can be happening. And it's specific to each different policy. So the National Flood Insurance Program, for example, or the unemployment insurance that's, that's happening in the US, um, which I think is definitely a good thing, but it's leading to um, this drag on the economy in the long run. That mechanism is probably very different in other countries based on their specific policies. And then I think this is something which is probably uh, an enormous hindrance for Puerto Rico going forward in the next 20 years, particularly with this debt crisis that it's facing. Um, I think that's where I want to stop. And I'd be very interested in particular discussion to have on thinking about this policy. What is this policy gap? What are we doing in the near term, which is leading to this long term effect? Or what are we not doing in the near term, which is leading to this long term effect? Um, and try to get some of your perspectives on that. I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, hello. Um, my name is Charles. Uh, I have a question with respect to Puerto Rico and listening to everything you said. Uh, and it's like a two part question. First, do the negative impacts of these hurricanes have a compounding effect on each other? So, like when you said, that it dropped 21 percent. If the hurricane was to hit again next year, would that be another 21 percent? Will it will it will it compound? And if if so, in some way, could you predict a point in which there would be a point of no return for Puerto Rico? Like it just totally crashes and. Do you want to ask both together, or would you oh, want me to? Yeah, no, just. We could do it with this. So, so the, um, it's interesting. As I showed, there's this repeat effect um, impact that happens if you get a storm right afterwards. So if Puerto Rico to get, were to get another storm today, in fact, this is quite similar to what happened in Haiti after the earthquake. This hurricane went over, and people were you know, extremely exposed, extremely vulnerable. Nowhere had been rebuilt, and people were living in large slums. And a hurricane came over. So you see this kind of double impact. You could, with what we're doing here, um, 
come up with scenarios. So if a storm hit next year and give a range of magnitudes, if a storm hit in two years, three years, five years, and give a range of magnitudes for those. Um, so we could definitely do that and think, what's going to happen to push Puerto Rico extremely low? What will happen at some point is that, is that everything that can get, everything that's immediately exposed will start to be damaged. And if it's not getting rebuilt, then it's going to be, there's going to be less to damage. So it will actually look like Puerto Rico is becoming more adapted. So this is this weird thing in the way we think about adaptation. We think about adaptation meaning that damages are lower. But if damages are lower because I'm Japan and I've invested in this amazing infrastructure, then I'm in the good equilibrium. If damages are lower because I'm Haiti and I don't have that much left to be destroyed, then I'm in the bad equilibrium. But it kind of looks like both of them are low damage scenarios. Um, so that's kind of what starts happening in Haiti. If it's too, in, sorry, in Puerto Rico, if it's too frequent, um, the, the point of no return would be a difficult thing to kind of talk about and think about because of the way the capital is not getting rebuilt, because of the way people's behavior might change, that kind of stuff. But we could do something which definitely looks at some scenarios for that. I'm, I'm curious. Um, were you just focused on Puerto Rico? What about USVI? Because they were affected by Irma and Maria pretty heavily as well. So we didn't focus on the Virgin Islands. Um, this was kind of at the specific request of Puerto Rico. Um, this has come up a few times. So Fiji had a major hurricane maybe three or four years ago. And we write something in the, in the paper that says this could be a big deal for Fiji. And then it, uh, I think it was discussed by the finance minister. Like, these academics don't know what they're talking about. Fiji are going to grow back and be amazing. Um, and that's not really, we're not trying to do it out of any form of criticism. So we could do exactly the same projection for the Virgin Islands. I think because the, the reason that Puerto Rico became, the reason that the, the people working in Puerto Rico became so interested in this was because they needed to make a population projection and an economic projection in order to think about how much debt they would pay back. Okay. So the USVI didn't have that same situation. Yeah, that um, Exactly. So I'm, I'm curious why the trend lines don't have built in the expectation of these disasters, especially the ones where they have repeated disasters. Ah, so this is more, this is kind of a, a, a display thing. We're, we're just showing what the trend line would be with no disasters, but in that when I showed this repeated disaster happening, as the, the first disaster happens, it pulls the, the GDP growth down. That becomes the new trend line. And that's the one that gets, um, that we, we divert off from. Um, so it's more a display thing. This is a really great talk. Thank you. Um, and uh, my question is, uh, you characterize this as uh, an analysis of the impacts of natural disasters. Have you also looked at the impacts of human-caused disasters like terrorism? On a, you know, on a so, large yeah. scale, small scale, because there's databases out there that, that discuss that. Um, so this is where my, my cautious academic hat comes on. And I say, well, I don't know much directly about that. And then I try to change the question about something else. But if I, I try to not put on my, my academic hat, um, I think it's important. So thinking about, I characterize this as disasters, but I specifically talk about hurricanes a lot. And then there's some, I'm doing some work on flooding. I have a, a co-author doing work on earthquakes. Um, it's important to think about what's particularly distinct about those. So I mentioned this idea of, of Japan and bombing. So maybe terrorism fits a little bit more into that. It's a, it's a human-caused violence. There are a different set of policies and a different expectation about their return interval, probably. 
um, I will think about terrorism very differently than I'll think about a disaster. And so the policies for dealing with them would obviously be very different. In terms of what this would do to a, an economy, um, I think because in comparison, the destruction is quite limited from a single event, you wouldn't see this same event. I mean, the, 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 the economic damage from a hurricane that hits Florida is, is enormous. It would be hard to cause that much with a single terrorist event. For a large-scale civil war or a cluster of large events, you might be starting to approach that. So that was why I put this, this thing up in the context of a civil war. Um, but I think, to answer your question, it would probably be, they would be distinct for various reasons. The policy responses would be different um, for thinking about these long-term things. And I think that the magnitude of the events before they get to a large scale um, would probably put them in a, a smaller range than what happens from, you know, Harvey or Irma, for example. But it's an interesting question. I'm, I'm, people do look at it, but not really thinking about economic growth. There's a lot of other things that happen to an economy when, when you enter a situation of large-scale civil strife that could also be causing degradation to the economy. So my question is kind of going off of that, but more in regards to your model and the counterfactual slash controls that you, you used. Um, did you, sorry, <laughs> um, so did, did you take into account the likelihood or existence of human-made disasters or like conflicts in the, in the areas when you looked at it, when these papers were run on a global scale? Or when you controlled for that, did it just not matter enough? Or was it so small in the aggregate that it wasn't worth looking at? So there's one, there's, there's a, uh, first of all, I'm glad to know that you, you remembered all the terminology from the last quarter. Um, <laughs> but the, yeah, so it's kind of interesting in thinking about, when I showed this table of the financial crises, other things like that, a financial crisis can't lead to a natural disaster occurring. The natural disasters are what we call exogenous. They're kind of random. They're external to the system. Um, we can predict them to some extent, but you can't tell exactly where a hurricane's going to happen. Um, so the causality can't go from financial crisis or conflict to causing a natural disaster. It could lead to extra population vulnerability when a disaster happens. But you could also think of the disaster or the environmental thing leading to conflict, financial crisis, currency crisis, something like that. So that's potentially one mechanism for, that's potentially a set of mechanisms for what you're seeing here. Um, you could think of the other thing in, in, in Aceh in Indonesia after the earthquake, it was famous for bringing about, the earthquake was famous for bringing about peace, um, but essentially the, the uh, civil war which had been going on in Aceh for, for many years, uh, people were so badly affected that the costs of conflict were essentially too high for people. So you can think of it in some other way. But it's, it's, there's potential for some of those things to be mechanisms here. In as much as they are driven by the storms, and the storms kind of happen out of nowhere, we're picking up something which is maybe inclusive of them, maybe independent of them. But the human-caused ones, rather than the storm-caused ones, are not going to trouble the, the estimates in any way because they're not related. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. But doesn't uh, human effect on some of these natural disasters diminish it heading forward? Like, uh, down in, oh, okay. like down in Houston, where uh, you know, they knew that they were going to be uh, yeah. more susceptible to uh, flooding. And so they, what they did was that they then designed a way to build the roads down there that draws the water away. So the next time you have a natural disaster, the impact gets marginally less and less and less. Uh, Haiti, building codes, they were yeah. pretty much in existence before. Now all of a sudden they have building codes built in. And so every time you have a natural disaster, you tend to get more human input. Uh, Katrina, uh, you know, Corps of Engineers told them they should never have built in certain parts yeah. of New Orleans. And they did anyhow, uh, because again, humans have a very short uh, memory. And uh, after, the, after the parishes got completely flooded and wiped out, uh, the Corps had recommended not to build in those areas again. And what did they do again? Yeah. They built. 
in the exact same areas. But I, I, you know, there's some sort of learning curve that does come from this with natural disasters in which, you know, they seem more prone to um, to anticipate them to lessen their impact based on technology. How does that figure in on the on the recovery process? So I'm. That's a very that question touches on a lot of things. I'm going to try and make sure that I, that I hit as many of them as possible. So all of those things, in as much as this is an exercise looking at every hurricane impact and every GDP trajectory of every country, any policy response that was made is included in here. So it seems like all of those things, we, we don't have the world where, where Japan, for example, didn't change its building codes to, be, to have earthquake-proof buildings everywhere. And so it's difficult to estimate what would happen if they had never done that. What we're doing here is inclusive of all of those. Okay. So even with those things, um, there's, some, there's some residual effect. Okay. But what you're saying is, is, is obviously perfectly, it's, it's absolutely correct. And this is something which has been seen by some researchers, but it's very difficult to know when a disaster is going to trigger that big policy response. We have two things. We have kind of the impact and then we have the behavior. We can observe that places that get more frequently exposed, or I do a lot of work on climate change and weather impacts, and you see places that are hotter yeah. on average. You know, in, in Houston, they have air conditioning. In Seattle, they don't have air conditioning. If Seattle got as hot as Houston, they would all have air conditioners. And so you'd see this different effect of heat. The same is true for disasters. Like in Chicago, we're not going to build to protect ourselves from hurricanes, but if for some really bizarre reason hurricanes started coming up here, we might start investing in it. Um, so that's true, and we can see that in the data, that places that are more frequently exposed are, they're getting less damage for each event that hits them. But what exactly triggers, I mean, that's a whole set of policies and behavior that we're picking up here. Yeah. What exactly triggers those specific ones or what ones are the right policies um, is really like an open and fascinating question, and that's, the other thing too is that the intensity of the storms, you know, uh, with the climate change, which we, you know, the Earth has always gone through climate change. Uh, I remember when the Russians were drilling to the bottom of the, what was it, the Antarctic, in which they found uh, fossils of planets that only exist in 70 degree weather. And so we know that there's been many times in which the Earth has been ice free. And so, you know, with added levels of water, the, you know, the, the form, the intensity, the uh, magnitude of the storms are different than when. We have a lot of ice when you know when uh, the winds you know uh, are less. Um, so it's a you know it's always a dynamic type change. Is you know we're you, you can never assume that the uh, 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 earthquake will always be at this level. It may be increasing levels, uh, maybe lessening levels. So on the climate change thing, we we do. So first of all, I'll I'll say that the rate of the changes that we're seeing and the magnitude of changes that we're seeing in the climate are faster than anything that has been observed in the history of the planet. Um, and in particular, there any changes which did happen before, which we see on some like graph which has a 10 million years on the, on the x-axis and we see these big changes, they're happening over the course of thousands or even millions of years. Um, and so those changes were very slow. It allowed for people to adapt. The changes that we're seeing now are not only bigger in extent than some of those, but also our species wasn't in existence when those things were there. So it, it's a very, um, like this, the, the, the experiment of turning up the thermostat on the Earth at the moment is probably a, a bit of a wrong-headed one. We look at that, so the, the best evidence at the moment shows that the intensity of, of, of hurricanes is going to increase. And so then we have two things that relate to your previous question. You have places that always get hit by disasters, but maybe they don't think that it's in their best interest because it's too expensive to make a policy or to, to build these kinds of permeable roads, for example, or something. There will be places that are experiencing more intense disasters and so adopt those policies that wouldn't be for. So you're gonna see the, in, the impacts decrease. But then you're also gonna see the intensity and, the, and some, to some extent maybe the frequency increasing, but mostly the intensity. So as they're adapting, they're in this race against how much the intensity is increasing and it's unclear who wins in that situation, particularly for, for infrastructural investments, which are, you know, we put down today and it's 50 years. If we're not thinking what the world is going to be like in 50 years, then we're not engineering our way out of the problem in the way we should be, I think. 
Uh, my name is John Fitzpatrick. Um, I'm actually in the uh, liberal arts program, but this is interesting. Very thought-provoking presentation and, and the work involved. Um, and I'm, I'm curious about your research. Um, I mean, we know from thousands of years ago when earthquakes happened in places like Greece, people just picked up and left and migrated. So migration happened and nothing was rebuilt where the earthquake occurred for lots of reasons. But in places like Houston, uh, Harvey, where the estimates are that there's um, you know, huge loss, um, but we know that uh, 35 or 40 billion of the 70 to 90 billion um, of loss, and these are uh, one of the cat modeling firms, RMS, that come up with these numbers, 35 or 40 billion was insured loss and so that money starts flowing in and buying wallboard and uh, construction materials and new cars and all sorts of things and we also know that the government approved you know 36 billion more uh, for I think Harvey and maybe Irma and I don't know what they did with Maria but so there's a lot of there, we're talking about 70 billion worth of hard cash going into what is measured by GDP uh, and it is hopefully some of it's going into things that are better construction, better building codes, better infrastructure uh, uh, solutions. Uh, so I'm a little bit su surprised by the fact that if there's a, a high level of insured loss, uh, why you're not seeing in the data um, the immediate boost to GDP that comes from that, because that money goes right into GDP. It's measured in GDP. It's measured in national income and and um, personal income. Um, whereas the stack of what was destroyed is n is not in GDP. In other words, it's not like a zero sum game. You build back a house. The way it's measured, it, the the fact that the assets got wiped out doesn't subtract from GDP. So. I'm really um, mystified that the numbers don't show kind of a boost in GDP <coughs> while the building and construction is happening after an event where there are, uh, in places like America, U United States and Japan where it's heavily insured. So again, another question that touches on a lot of things and I'm gonna try and um, make sure that I cover all of them. So one thing which I, which I didn't quite talk about here but is kind of my working hypothesis for what's happening and this, broadly orbits around your question. We have this idea, so GDP, um, which I mentioned very briefly, you, you do see this construction boom. So sometimes in the year after, GDP uh, looks like it's, it's uh, increasing. Um, that's what a lot of people would have said is this build back better type of idea. But what's happening in a lot of those cases is that I have money to invest in something. Um, particularly if it's federal money. So there's, there's very low rates of insurance for flooding. So a lot of the Harvey damage, for example, was flooding damage, and people just don't buy their insurance. It's not priced right. And they also know that in the case of a big flood like this one was, um, the government's going to bail them out. And that's what happens often with the National Flood Insurance Program. People don't buy in a lot of disaster areas because they know that the government is an automatic insurance mechanism. Um, so that's one thing. To the, the level of insurance is too low. But if you think about it then as, I'm going to use the word counterfactual again, what, what would have happened if we, if we didn't build this fantastic factory? So before I said, build back better idea was you have a bad factory, it gets knocked down, you build back a much better one, it's more productive. But where did that money come from? And what would have happened if we didn't experience that disaster? If we didn't experience that disaster, we would have had a bad factory and a really good factory. It could have been invested somewhere else. And so in particularly in the case of, of federal disbursement of funds, you're seeing that <coughs> money which could be going to some other productive investment somewhere else is going towards rebuilding things. So that's one part of it. And that might be one reason why we see this. That's like a misallocation issue. And that might be one reason why we're seeing this. Another reason why we, we might not see a boom that is lasting um, 
is because of precisely what's insured and what's not insured. Um, so we see it in the immediate term, but as I said, some of these mechanisms are people going on unemployment insurance, for example. So the people who would be uninsured might be the reason why this, there's this slowdown effect on the economy. Um, and then the other reason probably being like low-ish low levels of insurance, given the risk that people in different places are, are facing. So there's many reasons why you see that, but you, you're definitely correct. You do see this boom in construction, and often after a disaster, you see, particularly driven by, cons by construction, you see this big spike in GDP and then kind of nothing in the subsequent years because of what, because what's damaged and what's missing doesn't get counted. Does that, did that touch on? Well, um, I, I, I guess I'm thinking about the fact that we live on planet Earth, and Earth has windstorms, earthquakes, and they will, they have happened in the past, they will happen <coughs> in the future. And so there is no um, state where there are no storms. To, and, and that comparison to me is less useful because that state of the exactly. world doesn't exist. So it seems to me what matters is these things are going to happen. I completely agree with you about the climate change and the intensity and the severity of the storms will go up, particularly in the areas that are populated. Um, so uh, it's all about, you know, how do we finance these losses? Should we, should we pre-event, um, do mitig loss mitigation? And it looks like you've got evidence that says it's valuable to do that. Should you f finance for it in advance by buying insurance and having tens of billions, hundreds of billions available to, to flood in to the e economy and, and um, uh, rebuild better. It seems to me those are things that do make sense. Yeah. But we know governments don't buy insurance pre-event. They s barely have enough money, let's say, let's use Chicago or Cook County or Illinois as an example. They barely have enough to pay for their current operating expenses and rarely do they have the money to pre-event or pay for a one in a hundred year event. Yeah. They just won't do it. And yet that's what they should do because what they have to do later is increase taxes um, which cause migration and so on post-event if they finance that way. That's the history of some of this elsewhere. So I, so I completely agree with you. The, the, and this is probably the, the place that I like I'm interested in a discussion going because the we're seeing this residual effect in the long run because there's some policy failing and insurance in this country in particular and many others is is it's not accurately priced for environmental risk it's low people are assuming that the government's going to bail them out in many cases um, so it's not optimal and that's kind of the situation with a lot of the policies we have they're not optimal a lot of the the building and urban planning in Houston was also not optimal knowing what the flood risk was so there's this, there's this social planner view that, that we need to increase insurance um, penetration, we need to plan properly, and that might be the policy that deals with this, or the set of policies. Um, and I think that's the right place for a debate to go after something like this happens. Not for all the media and everyone to focus on I mean, they rightly should focus on making sure people are safe in the near term, but to very quickly try and turn it into how can we stop this from happening again? And as you said, these things happen all the time. But there, we know that enough, and we know that there's a set of things that work, a ways for us to, p to pool our risk to insurance, that would actually be very good policies to adopt here. So that's one thing. I completely agree with you that you know, we're in a suboptimal world in terms of policy and in terms of how we think about these things. Um, on a, on a related note, there's, so I say that as the, the dispassionate social planner with some welfare function of everybody in mind, and I want to improve everybody's welfare, and then I'm going to say, oh, well, you are living in the, the, the marginal person living in Puerto Rico. I'm going to say, no, you're living in the wrong place. I'm going to move you over here. But that's completely ignoring then the human side of this. The reason why people would stay in New Orleans without a job is because of their social network. These other things, amenity, value, familiarity of place, family, all these other things, which the dispassionate economic social planner wouldn't see. 
So it's also important in thinking about that kind of stuff. I mentioned the, the uh, National Foot Insurance Program where you have people whose houses have no value and can't move. And we say, well, you're the problem. You're getting a, a grant every year to rebuild your home. And they could turn around and say, like, I, I can't go anywhere. My family is here. My social network, my social structure is here. I can't get access to anything else. It's important to think of those things when making the policy as well. So not just thinking what the optimal policy might be, but what is that optimal policy actually acting on and what, um, what context it's acting in. So I completely agree with you that we're in the suboptimal world, but also that the set of things we view in order to get us that optimum it needs to be much wider than the ones that we typically think of. Hi, um, I had a question about the slide you showed about the repeated exposure to storms. Um, and specifically, I was wondering whether what the effect of the time between two storms was. And my initial impression would be that um, as the time increases between the storm, the effect on the GDP over the long term would be stronger. But I was wondering whether that's reflected in the data or not. So <clears throat> now you point out all my, my statistical failings. Um, what we assumed for that was this thing called additive separability. So that one storm happens, and it's not interacting with the next storm that happens. And we estimate this effect. What we would need to do to estimate what you're talking about is try to look at the return period. So we kind of do that in terms of the, the average frequency of storms. And we see that the ones that get a lot of storms have these lower damages. But that doesn't really say, that means on average over a really long term. What that doesn't really say is what happens if, again, by random chance, like in the, the question that came up earlier, if Puerto Rico was to have a storm, had the storm last year and was to have one next year versus having one in 15 years time, and what the difference would be there. Um, and the answer is, I don't know. So part of the, the reason for that is that it's a difficult thing to estimate with any kind of precision to say something. Um, and you could imagine it going kind of both ways. I think the, the question earlier about what leads to a policy change, I think that's an important question for people to start looking at and something that I'm interested in looking at. Um, maybe it's the case that two disasters right after the, the other leads to this change in building codes or change in something that helps us in the long run in a way that one disaster and then one 15 years later doesn't. But it's a question that I don't know the answer to, but I think one that's very important. I think we have time for one more. You had your hand up. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> Last question. Uh, well, that's too much pressure. Um, I was just uh, thinking back on the that race you're describing of adaptability versus escalation of climate change um, and looking at the policy gap have and the political moment we're in and the fact that that escalation of climate change is being called into question right now. Um, I'm wondering, did you look in your model at all at how the gravity of the situation is going to change and how the economic effects might increase over time? So <clears throat> it's a great question. I love talking about climate change. Um, the we do look in the paper at some climate change projections for what's going to happen to storms. And as I said, there's this, there's this result that the intensity will increase, the frequency probably won't change for various um, meteorological reasons. We project out into the future what effect that would have, but in, with a very strong specific set of assumptions, which is that people aren't going to adapt. We just kind of look at what the risk is. If you dropped climate change on top of people now with no policy change. Um, and so that makes it something which is suggestive of how important it is, but not probably a good prediction of the future. So for that suggestive exercise, there's a it's kind of a well-known paper by one of the, the forefathers of thinking about climate change impacts on the economy called, called Bill Nordhaus at Yale. And I think he put the value of, I'm probably going to get these numbers wrong, um, he put the value of climate change to the global economy at something like 15 trillion, and we find an extra 9 or 10 trillion because of our effect. So just to put those side by side, we think this growth effect is, um, is enormously important financially and enormously important as a climate change impact, and one which has never really been included before. Um, but it's not something that we, that I would stand behind and say, this is what the future will look like. So I think it's, we, Explore to the extent that we think it's important and should be on the forefront of people's mind. 
um, but not to the extent we would say, here's the direct policy from that. I think more generally, while, while we're on the topic of climate change, so it will increase risk to some extent um, for these things, um, also for a lot of other stuff. So the other part of my life is really trying to solve the issue of how to use data to inform um, what the costs of climate change are. I've got this enormous uh, project with about 25 people working on it now trying to do just that, to come up with this thing called the social cost of carbon. The political moment we're in is, is one such that the current <coughs> social cost of carbon, this measure of the damages from climate change, has been effectively set to zero through some anti-scientific manipulations of the, the methodology. Um, and that kind of thing, to leave everyone on a really optimistic note, there is a, a erosion of the like previous climate change denial debates back and forth. There was always some recourse to data. Now it seems like, or to facts, now it seems like we're entering a world in which uh, facts just don't matter, um, which is hard for someone who, who tries to generate them for a living. But it's a pretty worrying time um, to see that those kind of things are being disregarded. This kind of research has filtered its way into how the Puerto Rican government is thinking about their future, and that's a really positive sign, um, probably more positive than you know, like what the outcome is. Um, but it's a rare case where someone will go and pull a number out of a research paper. So it's a big issue and it's a worrying time. It's good to see people dealing with this rigorously in some way. Um, and I can only hope that the, the future brings more of a view back towards what facts have to say. Thank you, Amir. Thank you for helping us to understand the relationship between natural disasters and economic policy. I learned a lot tonight, and I'm sure everyone here did as well. So again, let's give him another Thank round you. of applause. You can stay around to answer any questions sure. for a few minutes longer. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. My name is Marsha Hawk, and I am the director of the University of Chicago's Master of Science in Threat and Response Management program. We are sponsoring this event tonight, so thank you for all coming out. Um, as my colleague Natalie mentioned earlier, we have a number of um, elective courses that we would like to introduce you to, so please stop by our table and back and pick up information on the program. You're able to take courses outside of the degree program if you're interested in joining us as a student at large, or for those of you who are currently University of Chicago students, you may actually take them as elective courses in your program. So that pretty much concludes tonight's event. Thank you for coming out, and I'd also like to thank those who are joining us via live stream this evening. And I hope that you will join us for events in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.